The Land of Raw, Chapter 32 While the lost girls settle down in their camp, Wynne, Rose and I go back to the dojo where we've tied hammocks between the trees. The dragons have decided to sleep up there too and are curled together between the muddy rocks of the pretend magic road. As more and more stars come out, Wynne chatters on about how heroic we were riding Vlad, ignoring Rose's frequent request to, please shut up. Eventually, he drops off and soon his snores are competing with the low rumbling coming from the dragons. I can't sleep. I sway in my hammock, my mind stuck on Grandad. I've been doing this all day, counting down the hours, trying to work out just how long we've got left. I tell myself we've got time, that I need to stay calm and focus on getting into the crow's nest. But then I start doing sums again, and before I know it, I'm wondering if Grandad can feel cold or hunger when he's stuffed, if it's made his asthma better or worse, if he's frightened. I hate thinking that while I'm safe in my hammock with the warm stars shining on me. He's chained up in a cold dungeon. I hate thinking about this but I can't stop myself, and soon I'm willing the night away so that we can get on with our training and set off for the crow's nest. Rose's voice drifts out of the darkness. You awake, Arthur? I look over and see that she's sitting up, gazing towards the end. The stars are shining on the snow-topped mountains, turning them pink, then purple, then pink again. We never did get over there, I say. She shakes her head. It was always too far away. That's why we called it the end, because for us, it's where Raw ends. In the middle of the dojo, a dragon growls and flames roll towards us. Sparks drift past us like fireflies. Still think this isn't real, I say. Rose stares straight ahead. I can't. It's too frightening. People disappearing, the ground opening up, Crokey making an army and burning things down. We used to be in control of this place, but I don't know who's in control now. In the darkness I see her hug her knees. I can't wait until we go home, and we can go back to forgetting this place ever existed. The ground starts to shake, slowly at first, then harder, as if the roots of all the trees in the tangled forest are twisting and turning. My hands tighten round the ropes of the hammock as leaves fall on us and the dragons stir in their sleep. Suddenly, I realise that exactly the same thing happened yesterday. Rose, I think you just made that happen. She turns to face me. What do you mean? The same thing happened when we landed on Mitch's island. You said Raw wasn't real and straight away there was an earth wobble, or whatever it was Wynne called it. So? Well, just then you said you didn't believe in Raw, and boom, an earthquake hits. But Raw isn't real, is it? Not like home. There aren't photos of it. It's not on any map. Right now we haven't got a clue where we are. There's a grumble of thunder. Then a flash of lightning bursts from the sky and lands metres away from us. The dragon's eyes slide open and the hairs on my arms stand on end. Rose lets out a long, deep breath. OK, that was strange. Shall I say something to test it out? No, don't even think about it. If Raw comes from our imaginations, then maybe when we stop believing in it, it starts to fall apart and sinkholes open up and people disappear. Rose stares at me. Are you saying that the things that have gone, Mitch, the mermaids... The unicorns, they went because I stopped believing in them. I stopped believing in them too, until I saw Wynne in the attic and found the map. I'd almost forgotten about Raw, but not totally. No, I admit. There's something else. Wynne said that, that that big crack appeared on our birthday, at dusk, and we both know what happened then. The dragon fight, said Rose and I nod. I'd been out watching the new Star Wars film and when I got back Rose announced that she'd had a clear out and given Dad some toys to take to the charity shops. 
but they weren't any old toys. They were the models of dragons that we'd both been collecting for years. I flipped out, I say, remembering how I'd screamed in Rose's face, then charged into her room, looking for things of hers that I could give away. Me too. Rose had run after me, thrown me to the ground and sat on me. You said that you were never going to play with me again, I say. You said you hated me. And Raw nearly split in two. For a moment we stare across Raw. One of the dragons rolls over. The dojo trembles. But it didn't, I say. And we're here right now. Doesn't that make you believe in Raw? I can't. I want to go home. She almost shouts the words. I've changed. I'm not like you anymore, Arthur. I can't believe in any of this made-up stuff. This time, the ground shakes so hard that rocks crash down into the forest and birds rise up from the trees. The dragons wake up too. They huff and puff and send flames up into the sky to join the flashes of lightning that are exploding across Raw. Rose isn't saying she doesn't believe in Raw to be mean. She's just telling the truth. Rose does everything she can to fit in. Being able to crawl through a camp bed into a magical world isn't fitting in. It's the weirdest thing you could possibly do. I'm sorry, Arthur. I'm not sure if she's saying sorry for giving away the dragons or for pulling apart our incredible world. It's okay, I curl up in my hammock. We'll be home soon, I promise. Then I pull the blanket over my shoulders. Rose doesn't lie down. She stays where she is, staring across raw to the end, the light from the stars shining on her face.